In 2010, at the age of 17, I became a junior European all-around champion. As a kid, I was ruthlessly competitive and winning meant absolutely everything to me. At times throughout my career, I lost that killer instinct, but I was lucky enough to find it again towards the end. I've always been fascinated with what it is that makes a champion, and this is my story. So in today's episode, I'm going to explore what I think are some of the key ingredients that make up a champion. And it's one of the, I guess, the common themes and ingredients I've noticed in some of the great uh, athletes and gymnasts that I trained with, competed with over the course of my career. And the first one, and I guess the most important one in the, initially in the beginning is talent and talent gets you through the door. And when I was a kid, I was, you know, I certainly had a talent for sports and using my body and school didn't really make sense to me. Sport was the first thing that really made sense to me and my brain, my head, my body. And I always had a bit of a gift for doing lots of different sports. So when I was a kid, I played football. Uh, I got scouted for Nottingham Rugby Club, Nottingham Athletic Club. Uh, so I was really good at sports straight away and using my body and being outside and moving around, it just made sense. Now, I got spotted and scouted for my first gymnastics club trial when I was seven years old, and I guess the talent is what got me through that door. And I wasn't very good. Uh, I wasn't very flexible back then. I wasn't necessarily very good at the gymnastics skills. I just started it. But what I was was very strong. I had a natural ability for being very strong and powerful, and you know they gave, they gave me a chance, and that's what got me ultimately into gymnastics. And it's funny, when I started gymnastics, I, I didn't really think I was talented when I was a kid. And growing up, I really, I had built this narrative in my head that I was a kid that had to work hard. I wasn't quite as good as the other kids in my group. And I think that was because I started gymnastics quite late. Although seven is really young, for a sport like gymnastics, most kids are doing like mums and tots at the age of three, four, five years old. And the kids in my group uh, and my teammates at the time, Reese, Andy, they'd already been training since they were literally four or five years old. So they were just quite far ahead of me. And I always thought that was just... I compared myself to them and just thought that, you know, I'm not as talented as these guys, so I'm going to have to work much harder if I want to be as good as them. And it's interesting, and that, that narrative stayed with me throughout the whole of my gymnastics career. And looking back now, it wasn't until I met up with Reese and we went for a, we went for a pint and a game of pool. And he, he told me, like, do you know how talented you were when you were a kid? And I kind of looked at him and I said, what? I was like, what are you talking about? Because Reese, for me, was the most talented kid I'd ever come across in gymnastics. Throughout my 21-year career, he was just incredible. He was a performer. He could do nothing in the week. He wouldn't do anything in training. He'd kind of just mess around, half-heartedly try things, and then on a competition, he'd just switch it on, and he'd win. So for me, that coming from him, oh, I couldn't believe it. But looking back, I guess, at eight years old, I had my first trial for the GB team. And I'd only started gymnastics at seven. So a year into starting gymnastics, I had a trial for the Great Britain gymnastics team. So I must have been incredibly talented. Um, but I just didn't know it at the time. And like I said, I was really strong, really powerful. So I certainly improved very quickly on the floor, the vault and the rings. And on the rings, I remember one day we'd gone in, I think it was a Saturday... And Sergey was telling us about this skill called a crucifix. And there was nobody in our gym that could do a crucifix. And so we were all getting on the rings and trying it. And I was just kind of watching. Because I was quite shy back then when I was younger. I used to be very quiet in the gym. Uh, I'd have a big personality at home. But in the gym, I was quite quiet. Because there was a lot of big personalities in my group. And I can remember all the guys getting on and trying this crucifix and lowering down. And I thought, I'm going to have a go. And I kind of took myself off to one side. Uh, to the set of rings where nobody was really watching. I got up on these rings and I just went down and I held a crucifix at nine years old for like three seconds. And everyone in my group couldn't believe it. And Sergey straight away said, right, Sam, that's in your routine. So I was performing a crucifix on the rings, which is probably the most iconic skill in gymnastics at nine years old. So I must have been incredibly talented. And I think, you know, a lot of that probably came from my family and it came from my family background. All my family were, were sportsmen. So my, my granddad was a footballer, my dad was a footballer, I played football, my brother's a footballer, my granddad's brother was a speed skater, I had trials for the Olympic Games. I think my grandma's uh, dad was a really good snooker player. My mum did gymnastics when she was a kid. Uh, and my body type certainly lent itself to gymnastics. You know, I was small, powerful, uh, yeah, loved hard work but definitely had a natural ability for moving my body and knowing where my body was in space and time. So one of my key skills in gymnastics that was definitely one of my real super strengths was my spatial awareness. I was a bit like a cat. You know, I did get injured a lot, but that's because I took a lot of risks. But I could also, if I got lost in the air, I would always find my feet. 
And I guess one of the athletes that I really look to when it comes to talent, and I think about talent, one of the athletes that I trained with uh, and one of the great champions that we ever produced in Great Britain in gymnastics was Lewis Smith. And when I think about how good Lewis was on pommel, you know, he had a real gift. And from what I understand, like, Lewis was probably a lot like a lot of athletes. He was super hyperactive. Uh, I've heard him tell stories of, like, in the gym, he would just, like, flick pieces of foam at people and he'd always be sent to the rope to climb the rope. Um, and he could never concentrate at school, found school quite difficult. And he was very hyperactive. I, I believe that Lewis has got ADHD. So uh, his talent, though, was gymnastics, and gymnastics is what made sense to him. And he was so good on the pommel horse. And when I moved down to Huntingdon at the age of the age of 14, I left home, I went to live with another family and I stayed there for two years and I, I trained with Lewis and Dan Keatons at the time as they prepared for the Beijing Olympic Games and I just, I can remember the number of routines he used to do, like some days Dan and Lewis were doing 10 routines, I've never heard of any other gymnasts, even the likes of Max doing 10 routines on the pommel horse a day, like it was unbelievable, unbelievable the numbers he was doing and I think pe what people forget as well is that Lewis was really good on all six apparatus, so in Beijing he competed on six apparatus in the qualifying event and actually as we got older and Lewis actually in, in London he competed on the high bar and Lewis was brilliant, he was super talented for gymnastics and it was just probably his body type didn't necessarily naturally lend itself to some of the other events but he was really 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 good and super talented so when I think of talent I always think of Lewis because he had a natural gift for the pommel horse and I guess if talent gets you through the door work ethic is what gets you to the start line and that's something when I was a kid like I told you I had that narrative that I built up in my head that you know I'm not as talented as the other guys I'm gonna have to work hard and I started to connect the dots very early on that if I worked harder than the guys that were next to me in the gym. And, you know, if we had to do 10 chin-ups, if I did 11, or we had to do 1,000 circles, if I did 1,100, I had figured out that usually that meant to me not necessarily beating them, but certainly improving myself all the time. So once I figured that out, I, I basically dedicated my life to becoming the hardest worker in the gym. You know, I'd always heard quotes when I was a kid that, you know, be the first person in and the last person to leave. And I can remember reading Johnny Wilkinson's book when I was a kid and reading about how he used to stay after training sessions every day and hit 20 drop kicks on each foot. So I'd read that kind of stuff and it just fill me up and inspire me and, and confirm to me that I was doing the right thing and working the hardest. And I think the beautiful thing about gymnastics is, and any sport, to be honest, is that when you walk through that door or you step on that pitch, it's a level playing field. It doesn't matter where you came from like who your family are, like how much money you've got. It doesn't matter. All that matters is how hard can you work? Are you going to be respectful of the other people in the gym? Can you work in a team? And like for me, that's why I love sport. That's why I love gymnastics. And, you know, the first thing or the, the thing that impresses me the most when I'm working with other people or um, looking at young kids is how hard can they work? And I know that when I was a kid, if Sergey had gone out of the gym, and they left us to it, and we were doing conditioning, you know, a lot of kids would, if the coach wasn't watching, they'd do seven instead of ten, or they'd do six. And I just, I knew that that would make the difference in the end. And so if the co your coach could have left me, they could have left me in the gym on my own for four hours, and I'd never miss a rep. And I loved hard work, because I was a bit like Lewis, that when I was a kid, I had so much energy, I just didn't know what to do with it. And school was difficult for me, you know, I struggled concentrating at school, like reading and writing didn't make sense. But moving my body, it just seemed to calm me down, my brain races at 100 miles an hour. But when I've done sport, sport is the only thing that I've ever came across and ever done, that it just... I'm able to just focus on one thing and my brain switches off and I can focus on that activity and that sport or that skill or that move that I'm doing in that moment. So for me, sport was brilliant. It helped me calm down and all I wanted was hard work. Just throw as much work at me as possible. And, you know, I did at times used to get frustrated with my dad because I'd always be the last kid in the gym and our sessions used to finish at 8 o'clock and at like 8.45... I'd still be on the P bars trying to do dismounts and Sergey would be looking over to my dad and saying, Bob, five more minutes, five more minutes. And my dad would just look and he'd give him a thumbs up and I'd think, Dad, why can't you just say I need to, you need to take me home like all the other kids' parents? But I'm sure that's what made the difference in the end, you know, that work ethic. And that was instilled in me through my family values. Like my granddad was a farmer. Um, my mum's family, they were all from inner city. Not Nottingham didn't really have that much. My granddad was in the army. 
And that work ethic was always drilled into me when I was a kid, you know. D there's no, there was never any excuse. I never had an excuse. If I didn't work hard enough, my dad was on me. He didn't care how I performed and whether I won and stuff, but that was always putting in 100%. And I'm so grateful for that, that they ins my family instilled that within me. Because uh, it, it took me a long way. And work, like work ethic can take you a long way. And it certainly is what gets you to the start line. And I think the, the gymnast that epitomizes that for me it is a champion right now at this moment is Joe Fraser. He's, you know, he's kind of the generation below me. But what I think is amazing about Joe is that he never complains. He's always grafting. He always wants to improve himself. And watching him, like, I can remember in 2017, I shared a room with Joe at the European Championships. And that was like my last major championships that I ever competed in. And he was so eager to learn. He'd listen to all of the coaches. He just wanted to improve himself and get better. He worked harder than anybody in that little group of gymnasts that had gone out to that world championships. And he took his opportunity as well. That was a big thing. But when I look at like that generation below me, when I was a kid, all of the senior guys in the gymnastics team, most of them had like full-time jobs and gymnastics was a hobby. There was no clear career path. You couldn't make any money doing gymnastics. So we, we were all doing it purely because we loved it. And we were sold this dream of this Olympic Games, which was, it was amazing. It's amazing to look back now and think, wow, like none of our motivation came from ever like being famous, making money, like getting sponsorships that just didn't exist. We didn't even get funding back then. And like Joe's grown up in a environment where that is all there. If you do well, you can make money, you can get sponsors, you get attention, media attention, but it's never changed his work ethic. And I think he's a perfect example for all the young gymnasts that are out there and young athletes of how to do it. And, you know, what got him there, what got him to the position he's in is that hard work. Now, I think the next ingredient that I'd probably talk about after talent and uh, work ethic is probably a vision. And this one's super important. You've got to have a clear plan. And I heard this, uh, I heard this quote like recently that, you need to know where you're going. So if you just get into the car and put your foot on the gas and start driving without a destination, you're just, just going to drive around in circles. And I've certainly been guilty of that throughout my career, I think. And that vision for me, though, was that Olympic Games. And when Sergei told me that story of the honour to represent your country at an Olympic Games, and when I watched it on TV for the first time in 2004 in Athens, and my dad told me about the Olympic Games and why athletes got the Olympic tattoo, that became my vision, my plan my goal and my thing to aim towards. And my dad did something really clever when I was a kid. He printed me off a piece of paper. And it was the start of 2006. It was just after we won the bid for the Olympic Games. So I knew the, the, in six years' time, the Olympic Games were going to be in London and I'd have a chance to represent my country and go and compete in Olympic Games. And um, I can remember really clearly being, we used to drive to the gym at half six in the morning. Most of the time when it was still dark, it was winter time because it was the start of that year. So it was January, it was freezing cold. I think it had like snowed around that time. I can, rem I can remember on the car, it's saying minus 12 on the car. And Sergey's making us do these two laps around this field. And I'm running around this field and I'm going, and I can remember saying to myself, I've got six years, six years now to, to go until London 2012. I'm going to be on that team. I remember thinking that at 12 years old and having that clear goal and vision. And the reason that's really important is because that goal and that dream and that plan that you have, it's got to be strong enough so that on those days when it's snowing outside and it's minus 12, you will still get up and you'll get yourself to the gym and you'll put the work in and work hard. And I can remember that me and my training group at the time, so me, Reese, Andy, another lad called Zach, we all got this piece of paper and we wrote on this piece of paper, London 2012, Team GB, and then we wrote all our names and we said, we're going to be the team that goes to the London 2012 Olympics. And we basically climbed a rope in the gym at Knott's and there's a big metal steel girder. And we put this piece of paper in the girder and we said, we'll take it down after the Olympics in 2012, once we've all been to the Olympics and won a gold medal. Which is cool. I mean, that's an amazing story of like how inspired we were as kids and this big dream that we all had and we shared it together in our group. And Sergey had probably instilled that in us and inspired us with the stories he used to tell us. But the funny thing is, I climbed up that rope not long ago to get it back down. And uh, I left the gym at Nottingham at 14. 
to go down to Huntingdon to pursue my dream. This vision that I had, and I just felt that if I had stayed in the gym, Sergey wasn't going to be able to come and visit me, and I just wasn't going to have... I wasn't going to be able to achieve my dream. So we'd made this big life decision, me and my family, to move down to Huntingdon. And um, it wasn't well received within the club at the time. And the head coach that was left at the club, it's quite funny. I remember the last day that I had a training session in the gym at Knott's. He wasn't happy I was leaving. And uh, 14 years old, he kind of he took me to one side and he said, right, Sam, uh, I don't agree with your decision. I don't think it's going to work. I don't think you're going to make it. And you're never allowed back in this gym, so take all your stuff. I was 14 years old when he told me this, so I went and got my bag, and all the lads were saying, Sam, why are you going? Why didn't you tell us? Like, we would have stopped you. And I said, I know you'd try and stop me, but I've got to do this. Like, And I was dead nervous about leaving. You know, I was leaving home. I was going to be leaving my school, leaving all my friends at the gym. And uh, at the time, they basically, all the lads in the gym, this is a funny story because it, it shows you how mean kids can be, but it's quite funny. They used to call me Voldemort. They used to call me the, the boy who should not be named. That's what everyone used to call me at the gym. And they must have climbed up that rope, took that piece of paper down with all our names, and they ripped my name off it, but they put it back in. So you had those guys that were still in my group on this London 2012 like piece of paper still up there, and then my name on its own. And the funny thing is that in the end, I was the one that went, and they'd ripped it up. And those guys, you know, they had great careers, but they never went on to go to the Olympic Games. It's just a funny story. But that clear vision is really important. And I think the gymnast that comes to mind when I think about that vision is Max. You know, I grew up with Max. And all of these athletes that I'm speaking about today that I trained with, competed with, I've got so much respect for, and they all have all of these ingredients in different measures, I think, because I don't think there's one, there's particularly one that you need to have that is the key ingredient, apart from the last one I'm probably going to talk about. Now, uh, Max, when we were 17, we started traveling the world together, and me and Max, we were kind of taking on taking on everyone. We were new kids on the block and we were just 17 and we both made our senior debuts. And Max had gone to the Commonwealth Games and been really successful and I'd gone to the World Championships with the senior team. And a year after, we went to the Japan Cup. It was a team competition. We did really well. And it's the first time we'd ever beaten China in a senior team event. Amazing result. And me and Max, we were sharing a room. We used to share rooms back then. And uh, we're standing in this big open window in our room in Tokyo. Awesome, super excited because we're both exploring the world, going out there, doing what we love together. And we're talking about, like, I can remember asking Max, like, Max, what's your, like, plan? Like, what's your dream? Like, what do you want to do in gymnastics? And he had such a clear vision back then when we were 18. And he said, I'm going to go to three Olympic Games. And I hope that I'm going to have a child and my child's going to watch me do gymnastics. I want to still be doing gymnastics while my child's alive. I was thinking, how does he know that? We're 18, how does he know what he's going to be doing? Like, I couldn't understand how he had such a clear plan and a vision. And for me, I, I guess I'd always just thought that I'd been taught that gymnastics, you know, the peak age was 23, and I thought, well, I'm going to go to the Olympics at 23, I'll win a gold medal, and that's it, I'll retire. I didn't have, like, a, a real c clear plan. Certainly, like after the gymnastics and post-gymnastics. And I remember being 17 and making my senior debut at that World Championships and being in a room and sharing a room with the oldest guy on the team back then. His name was Ruslan and he was 27, I was 17. And we're sat in this room and I can remember thinking, this guy is so old. Like, I'm not going to be doing gymnastics when I'm 27. And, you know, before I knew it, time had flashed by me and I was that age, I was 27 and I retired at 28. So I carried on for a year after uh, Ruslan had carried on for and I think that clear vision is super important. And like I said, it's the thing that's going to keep you on track. And it is the thing that is going to keep you motivated, especially on them tough days, you know, because everyone, you're going to have them. It's easy for me. You know, when the sun's shining outside, everyone's a bit happier, aren't they? And everyone says hello to each other. It's a bit easier. Life's a bit easier. Work's a bit easier. And when it's the same when you're training and when you're in elite sport and the days where you feel fresh and, you know, training just seems to go smoothly and it just, you kind of ride that wave. They're not the important days for me. The important days are when your back's against the wall and you're struggling and you're tired, you're fatigued. You know, you might not have slept well the night before. You might have a little niggling injury. They're the days, and that's when you need that real strong vision and dream to remind yourself. Like I did when I was a kid and I had that piece of paper that my dad made me, and it said London 2012, Team GB, Sam Oldham. 
and it was put in the back of my wardrobe. So every morning when I'd wake up at six o'clock and put my tracksuit on to go to the gym, I'd see it. And when my brothers and sisters were asleep or my friends were watching cartoons before school in the morning and I was at the gym and I was missing birthday parties and I was working hard and I was jealous. I just wanted to be a normal kid. That reminded me, ah, I know why I'm doing it. It's because I've got that big dream, that vision to go to the Olympic Games. So I think vision is really, really important. And it was for me. It was huge. Um, and at times, you know, I, I think I lost that throughout my career. I, I kind of, I had that clear vision for 2012, but I didn't really necessarily have a plan after that. I think I definitely did for Rio 2016. But then, you know, when my injury happened and I, you know, ruptured all the ligaments in my ankle, that... Pfft, that, that changed things. And then post-2016, going into Tokyo 2020, I think more than anything, I did have a clear vision. My goal was to go to the Olympic Games. I'm not quite sure I had the self-belief to back that up. And I, I'm not sure that the goal was strong enough. Now, I gave it everything, but you know that played out the way it did. But I think in the end, I got that back. And the clear vision at the end was, I want to compete one more time. I want to experience all those emotions of a competition. And that made it so much easier for me training in those last two years and having to make myself get up through lockdown and go outside in the garden when no one's watching, doing gymnastics exercises and staying fit. That clear goal and vision helped me get through that. So that's super, super important. And I guess the last ingredient that I'm going to talk about today, and these are the four ingredients that I noticed they're, they're common. They were a common thread. And all of these athletes, that, all of the great champions I've trained with and co competed with, they all had these. And this was the key for me. It was self-belief. Self-belief is the most important thing. And everybody will have heard people say on TV when sometimes when a journalist interviewing an athlete or a coach and people say it's almost like a bit of an off-the-cuff comment now but you know sport is 90 percent mental and 10 percent physical and look a lot of sport is physical but when you get to the start line when you're taking the best 10 20 athletes in the world in any sport they could all probably beat each other on any given day it comes down to up here who's got it up there in their in their in their mind who's the strongest who's got the most self-belief and confidence and i certainly had that as a kid definitely early on I had that self-confidence I really believed in myself and that was really instilled into me through my family as well they were so supportive but I think as a teenager I was certainly a people pleaser as a young person and I wanted to make everybody happy and I think because my my dad was very successful but didn't quite make it in football and Sergey was incredibly successful and didn't quite make it in gymnastics for me they had so much self-belief in me. I was kind of a little bit confused by it and baffled. I can remember thinking, like, genuinely, my dad believed in me more than I've ever seen anybody else believe in anyone. Like, it was... For me, that was pressure. I couldn't believe that he's got so much self-belief in me and I don't, I don't feel that way about myself. Like, what if I don't live up to his expectations? And... Uh, and as a teenager, I was trying to please a lot of people, and in particular, my coach, you know. I would go and win competitions or do really well, and everybody would be coming up to me, patting me on the back. But unless I got that approval from Sergey, it meant nothing to me, you know. I was, I had lost that self-belief, and I was more reliant on other people's opinions of what I was doing. And their belief in me, I think, I kind of fed off that and... I, want, I needed people to tell me I was doing well and I was doing good. It wasn't coming like intrinsically through me. And I, again, I think I did get that back towards the end of my career. That self-belief came back and towards the end, it was brilliant. You know, I'd go into the gym and I, I'd kind of started to look back at the beginning of my career. And that narrative that I had really fed into this self-belief that I wasn't talented. I was just somebody that worked harder than everybody else. And I'm sure it was me kind of like counteracting myself ever becoming like a bit lazy and taking my foot off the gas or becoming cocky and arrogant. And because that was something that I think certainly Sergey and my dad were quite conscious of. They never wanted me to, they always kept me very grounded, which I'm super grateful for. But for me, I'm so self critical. I was never, ever going to become an arrogant athlete or person or gymnast because the my harshest critic was always myself inside my head, you know? And I think uh, that really looking back, that's one thing that probably really impacted me now. That narrative that I told myself as a real young kid that, you know, you're not that talented, you've just got to work harder than everybody else. And I think 
it played a massive role in getting me to the Olympic Games in London 2012, but it's also probably why I burnt out quite a bit as well towards the end of my career because I overtrained a lot of the time. Um, but at the end, that self-belief came back and I started listening to Sergey. I started believing him when he was telling me that, Sam, you can do this. Like, you're so, your gymnastics is so good, you can do anything. And I started to go, yeah, actually, I've done so much in my career. I must be pretty good. And I know that will sound crazy to people because I've, I've had a really successful career, but that self-belief, it just wasn't there a lot of the time, you know? And, and that really is the key ingredient. And I think the athlete for me that I trained with, competed with, and that I saw that had this unwavering, and everybody had it, and some of the athletes that I spoke about, and certainly me, I had it at times and then it went away. You know, it's, it's always, it's ever changing a, a career in sport. And for this athlete was probably Niall. And I remember Niall had so much self-belief that when he came onto the senior team at 18 and we had a training camp in Portugal and he's following himself around with his camera, interviewing himself, and basically making YouTube videos, and all of those older ads are kind of looking at him like, who the hell does this kid think he is? And all of the lads, the hardest thing that I think was the lads for his, the lads that were his age were thinking, who the hell does he think he is? Like, he's one of us, and he's now on that senior team, and he thinks he's better than everybody. But he didn't listen to all of that. He knew what he was doing, and he stuck to his guns. And I think I've, I've mentioned this before, but in 2016, at the second Olympic trial, when I stood there on the line next to Niall, and I said to myself, I can't believe I've done that. I think that says a lot about my own self-belief. And his response was, yeah, believe it. You're Sam Oldham. And I think that says a lot about Niall. And Niall went on to have an unbelievably successful career. And he's been successful not just in gymnastics, but in YouTube and all the other stuff he's doing. He's now on TV. But for me, his self-belief was just unbreakable, you know? You could have stood there and argued... He would have argued all day long, of course I'm going to be the best in the world. And all of the best champions I've met and come across, they've all got that. And I certainly had that at times. And I was lucky that I got it back towards the end of my career and I realised how good I was at it. And I used to enjoy it then. And I think a lot of that was that, that self-belief. It came down to that competitiveness. And when I was a teenager, I certainly struggled with... I kind of... I lined up competitiveness with kind of not having a lot of friends and I kind of like almost didn't want to be competitive. I didn't like that part of me. But at the end of my career, I really opened that up again and I embraced it. And we used to play trampoline landing games and I used to love it. And I, used to, and I was only, the difference was, and this is what I'd say the big difference is when it comes to self-belief. Those athletes I've spoke about, Lewis, Max, Niall, Joe, they're only competing with themselves. They're not competing with anyone else. They're in their own lane. Now, they go to a competition and they want to win. But they're just trying to make themselves better. They've got this big vision, this big goal of being the very best. And ultimately, it's very hard to compete with someone that has that mindset and that incredible self-belief. And I think they, for me, are the, they are the four key ingredients. And like I said, talent gets you through the door. Work ethic is what gets you to the start line. A clear vision is ultimately what keeps you motivated when the times get tough because they're going to get tough. But the key ingredient and the thing that makes all the difference and that separates the good from the, the, good from the great, I think, is that self-belief. And I'm going to tell a story about one more athlete. He was a hero of mine when I was a kid. And when I first watched that Olympic Games in 2004 in Athens on TV, he was competing there at 16. And he had all of these qualities. What a talent. The Olympic Games at 16 in men's gymnastics, unbelievable. And he was in the high bar final. And it was Hab Fabian Hambuchen, and he had his glasses on. And I always remember it because I drew a picture of him. I drew a picture of him doing a release and catch, and I've still got it. My mum's got it in a box. And he was one of my inspirations and my heroes. And he had so much self-belief because he was like nothing I'd ever seen in gymnastics. He was like a rock star. After he landed this man, he'd go crazy and scream and shout. And nobody did that in gymnastics because gymnastics is very traditional and everyone, it's all about respect. But he'd celebrate like he was a footballer. And for me, coming from a footballing background, I thought it was incredible. And his career arc was really interesting. You know, going into the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing, where I'd gone to, to watch with Dan Purvis, we'd been there in Beijing and we'd watched the high bar final. He was the favourite to win. He was the world champion at the time at just 19. And he was probably one of the most famous athletes in Germany at the time. He w really was in gymnastics. He was the man. He was the Conor McGregor of gymnastics at the time. And he went in as a favourite and 
for whatever reasons. And I, I did delve into this and ask him in the lockdown because I, uh, I was very fortunate to interview Fabian while I was doing one of my live streams. And I asked him about this time. And I think he, he, he basically said, yeah, he just lost that self-confidence, you know? And he, he was struggling, he was a bit lost. And he still did really well. He won a bronze medal at the Olympic Games in Beijing on the high bar and I watched him there. But he made a bit of a mistake. But he came back and the next year in 2009, he was actually the last gymnast to ever beat Kohei Uchimura before he went on his big run. And then he had a big serious injury, so he snapped his Achilles before the World Championships in 2009. And he was a favorite to go there and try and win next to Kohei Uchimura, that's now considered the greatest of all time. So he certainly had the talent, but he faced a big setback. And interestingly, I think I had these conversations with him and during that cycle, I got the chance to compete with him a few times. And he went into London and he won the silver medal on high bar behind his good friend Epke Zondelin. I'll tell you a funny story about Fabian. I competed in 2011 at the European Championships on high bar and Fabian wasn't in the final and it was in Berlin, that competition. And uh, the two German guys were in the final with me and we get to the competition and afterwards I walk out and I see Fabian and Epke Zonderland after I think Epke won the competition and I think a German gymnast maybe came second and third and I just missed out, I came fourth. My first ever competition, 18 years old, 15,000 people. I see Fabian greeting Zonderland and he opens his coat and he's got a Netherlands leotard on, so he's supporting Epke Zonderland, which is a funny story. I couldn't believe I'd like seen that. And he then came second to him at the Olympic Games, so they were great friends. And following that Games, going into Rio 2016, Fabian kind of, I got to know him a little bit and we competed in a competition in 2014. And this is, this is a story of what I think how, that separates one of the greats. Like, this is where I saw this firsthand with my own eyes. And I was competing in the Tokyo World Cup, best eight athletes in the world. Koei Uchimura's there, me, Dan Purvis for Great Britain, all of the best gymnasts at the time in the world, and Fabian was one of them. And we're standing there, and we're about to go out and compete in this competition, and I'm dead nervous, because this is a big opportunity for me. I'm 21, you know, my gym, my, this is my time to compete in the all-around there's a lot of pressure on me from the coaches at the time to get a good result and to start showing a bit of consistency. And I'm competing with the very best. I'm competing in an all-around final with the greatest gymnast of all time. My hero, my, my hero that I had when I was a kid, Fabian Hambuchen, that I watched on TV. And we're just about to walk out to do the floor. And Fabian turns around and he goes, hey guys, who wants to play a game? And I'm thinking, is this guy for real? I'm like shaking with nerves, trying to get in the zone. And he's so relaxed. He's asking us if we want to play a game. And he basically says, let's play a stick game. Let's see who can stick the most tumbles in their floor routine and dismounts in the competition. And I'm kind of like looking at him like, <laughs> like laughing at him like, yeah, that's a great idea, but I'm definitely not doing that. I'm just trying to focus on my routine. And he's gone out and you can go on YouTube and watch that routine. He stuck every single tumble. I could not believe it. It's one of the most incredible things I've like seen in I ever saw in gymnastics with my own eyes because it's one thing sticking a tumble or a routine or a dismount but saying you're going to do it to all of your competitors and going out and doing that that is just a different level uh, and then I had no doubts in 2016 he was going to go on after his um, 2016 debut at the Athens Olympic Games in the high bar final bronze in Beijing silver in London I knew he was going to win that gold medal and he actually uh, I I put a bet on him to win that competition. He won a gold medal. He won me a load of money. So I made sure afterwards, uh, the next time I saw him, I said, cheers, Fabian, you won me a load of money at uh, Rio 2016 when you won that gold medal. And it was just an amazing career arc that he had. And I think that kind of encompasses all of those things I've talked about today. And it kind of tells you that at the end, that key ingredient is that self-belief, you know? And he didn't. He kind of, he had lost that throughout his career and he got that back and built it back. And yeah, for me, the one thing I would say... The extra thing I'd add, and this would be a bit of advice that I'd give to young athletes around this and what makes a champion, what I've learned and what I've ab observed in the greats that I've trained with and competed with. One thing that's really difficult when you're younger is to, to know an opportunity is one when it arises. That's really tough. Like, that's very difficult because when I was a kid and I went to London 2012, in my head I'm thinking, well, I'm going to go to another two, three Olympic Games. I'm going to go to every World Championships and every European Championships and I'm going to win loads of medals. But you don't always get that second chance. So being able to recognise an opportunity is very, very hard to do. And taking that opportunity is sometimes what separates the guys that make it to the very top. 
there'll always be a chance. You'll always have an opening or an opportunity, but you've got to take it. You know, one of my favorite quotes is, when opportunity knocks, too many people are in the back garden looking for four-leaf clovers. And it's true. Like, you've got to take your chances. If you never give it a go, you'll never know. And you can sit and wait for the perfect moment. And I used to do this in my career growing up. In my early 20s, Sergey used to say, Sam, I think we can do this skill. I think you can push to win this competition. And I'd say, Sergey, I'm not sure. I don't think I'm quite ready just yet. Like, I need to wait a little bit longer. But sometimes tomorrow never comes. And before you know it, you're at the, you're at the end of your career. You know, and you don't get that second chance. So I think that would be the advice I'd give to any young athletes. If you get an opportunity, take it, grab it with both hands. Because how many people do you know that sit at home and say, I've got this brilliant idea for a business, but they never get off the sofa and they never try and do it. It's because it's hard. And taking those opportunities and being courageous and being brave is really important. And never be afraid of making mistakes. Making mistakes, it's just an opportunity to learn how to do it better the next time. You know, it, it's funny gymnastics is all about being perfect right the perfect 10 but it's impossible you can't be perfect and if you try to be perfect you'll never achieve it the greatest of all time Kohei Ochimori once said in a BBC interview um, they asked him what's your goal right now and this is a perfect example of somebody that it's almost impossible to compete against because they're in their own lane they're running their own race they're competing against themselves and he said my goal is to have a perfect performance have a perfect competition and I guess what he meant by that was stick every single landing, do a perfect routine without any big mistakes. He was never going to get a perfect 10 again. That's impossible nowadays with the rules in gymnastics. But he came very close in 2014. And if you ever go and watch that World Championships all-around final, I think the only step he took was a small hop on parallel bars. Other than that, he stuck everything. And for me, that's he did have the perfect competition. He was the perfect athlete in many ways. Um, so yeah, I guess that advice for me that I would give all young athletes is if you get an opportunity, take it, grab it with both hands, go for it. And those four key ingredients are really important. Talent is what gets you through the door. Work ethic is what gets you to the start line. The vision is what keeps you motivated during the difficult times. And the key ingredient at the end that you've got to have is self-belief. It's got to be authentic. You've got to believe it. You can't fake it till you make it. And ultimately, you build that self-belief and confidence through evidence. So going out there and having a good competition, getting some good results, will make you feel more confident and believe in that dream that you have for yourself. Um, but yeah, they're the four key ingredients. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. It was a little bit different. And I will see you in the next one.